This won't be easy. Birthday party I ever had, but by far the nicest and the most wonderful. And I thank every one of you. And a happy first day of summer. <laughs> well, I had a lot of fun with this station for 11 or 12 years, working with people who were in the business the way I was. And it brings back a lot of memories. I'd like to share a few of them with you. I was first on radio in KSTP Minneapolis when I was the face with a Sunday night, or the Sunday morning rather, choir on KSTP. That was 72 years ago. I was just a little kid, of course. Yeah. And the next time I was on LW at 1947. How many years ago was that? <laughs> 60 years ago. I can't believe it. And we're some nice people, like you mentioned a few of them. Willie Call, Bob Shree, Bruce Lyon. Marrying somebody who wants to marry. <laughs> People say, how did you get started in, in radio? Well, in, in, during wartime, I was in the Afghan invasion in November of 42. And in Tunisia, my uh, platoon was sent out about a half mile ahead of the main line. And we had over 80% casualties. I was one of them, I had shrapnel in the legs. And going back to the, uh, uh, the headquarters and the first aid headquarters, there's a little private whose name I never found out who was helping me walk. I was hit shrapnel in the right leg. <coughs> My head was here, his head was about there. Shrapnel hit him in the head and killed him instantly. Oh. Oh. So I crawled back to the first aid station. And I was in the hospital, four different hospitals, coming back to Algiers. And uh, finally they were letting me out at night with, with, with a couple of canes to learn to walk again. And I went to the Red Cross Club, <clears throat> and this fellow came up with a microphone, put it in my face, and interviewed me for about 45 seconds. And after the war, my mother said, Billy, we heard you on NBC. And I found out later, it was a great announcer in NBC. I forget his name right now. I called him Andy, because I knew him in New York later on. <clears throat> and my old voice teacher, Leon Cruzy, from the Conservatory of Music, said, Bill, W.L.W. -W -W wants an all night disc job. Why don't you go down and audition? So I did. And I read the script, pronounced the words correctly. One of them was Archdiocesan, I remember. <laughs> And after I was finished, I heard them talking in the control room. And I could see them, and all smiling. And the little kid came out, and he said, Billy, of course, you've been in radio before, haven't you? I said, yes. I went to the Armed Forces Radio Network and the Afro-European Theater. I didn't tell him I'd gone for 45 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> then after I, I, I got better, I left the infantry and went to the military police, and I guarded a guy named General Eisenhower. And I had honor guards for a lot of different people. And uh, he said, well, hey, Lieutenant, we're going to have some very important people up in Tunisia. So I would go up there. But before I tell you about that, I want to tell you something else. <coughs> I had played poker now and then before the war, and every once in a while during the war. I wasn't great at it. <coughs> And uh, the greatest hand I ever had was a, was a full house, a three of a kind and a pair. You know. Every now and then I would see somebody with a royal flush, which was the greatest hand you could get, of course. Ace, King, Queen, Jack, Ten, in the same suit. Spades, diamonds, hearts, hearts, diamonds, and clubs. So I, I, I took the guard up to uh, Tunisia, and we had some very important people there. And, uh, oh, before I, I tell you that, I had, I had seen the Royal Flushes now and then. A friend would have one, and I saw some in, in the movies, too. I never got one myself. This is the National Broadcasting Company. <laughs> so when I got up there with the Honor Guard, 
these important people came up this balcony, took a bow, and I saluted. We played the national anthem, we played the British national anthem, and so on. And that afternoon I met them all. There were two generals who later became uh, field marshals. Anthony Eden, Winston Churchill, and King George VI, the father of, of Queen Elizabeth II. And the first afternoon they had a meeting in a beautiful living room about the size of this sitting down. And I had a few guards around so that the wrong people couldn't get in. And then suddenly the King George stood up and he stood himself and he went to a right around the corner to the first to the first door, which was the men's restroom. That was the first time I ever heard a royal flush. <laughs> The only other personal story I have, the one I thought up years ago, what is the biggest lie ever set to music? Betty Grable singing, I ain't got nobody. <laughs> Wait, quit by your head. <laughs> well, as a matter of fact, I met three presidents. I guard an eyes now in Africa. Then in 1945, when the war was over, after May the 8th, was it? We went to the Potsdam, which is part of a greater part of Greater Berlin. And Winston Churchill was there again. And Joseph Stalin was there from Russia. And Winston Churchill was there again. But uh, Harry Truman, who represented the United States, so that was the second president that I met. <coughs> then after my career in New York, everything moved out to California, it seems. And I went out there in the middle 60s. We did a show with a kid named Regis Philbin coming up. And we had a fellow on the show who was thinking of running for governor of California. His last name was Reagan. I called him Dutch. <laughs> because Dick Nesbitt, who'd been a sportscaster in Cincinnati, had told me before I left in New York, Bill, if you ever meet an old friend of mine out there, tell him hello. We worked together in Des Moines, Chicago. And it was Dutch Reagan, who was a great guy. He was very cool quiet spoken and always had a nice smile on his face but I mentioned New York a while ago uh, I, I was at LW in 1947 <clears throat> and after four years I left to go to New York City uh, I starred for a few days then I worked on the plain clothesman for the Dumont Network and did shows on NBC, ABC and CBS but I worked with such people as Johnny Carson, Jackie Gleason, Milton Berle, Red Skelton, and Arthur and Catherine Murray. Arthur Murray. And his wife was a, was a, was a doll. She was really. And they had a little daughter, Jane. I knew her before Dr. Henry Heimlich maneuvered her in a marriage. <laughs> they live in Hyde Park, I believe, right now. But isn't, isn't that a bunch of people, though? I hate name dropping, because they once said to Clark Gable. <laughs> <laughs> Just a couple of quick stories for you. I'll say the best for last. I'm almost finished, honestly. Red Skelton said this kid was born in. Cape Cod. His father was a professional deep sea fisherman. And he had fish to eat seven days a week. And his favorites were uh, marlin, tuna, and strad, and sea bass. And then he was taken into the army. And he wound up in Texas. He had some great Mexican food, but no seafood. And he's just dying for it. For he went a year without any. Then he heard he was going to be transferred. He said, oh, I hope I go to California or, or Florida. I'll get some seafood. He went to Kansas. <laughs> he got great steaks, but no seafood. Finally, his time is up, and he knows he's going back home to Boston. And he's all blissed up, and his duffel bags on his back, and so on. He gets on the train. He doesn't sleep all night long on that train. And the next morning... 
is coming into Boston and is slowing down, and he goes out and stands between the two cars, you know, and he can smell the sea, the, uh, the sea water. He says, oh, I'm going to have seafood again. And just as the train slows down, it doesn't even stop, he hops down off the step, goes across the street to this rank of taxi cabs, and says to the first driver, can you tell me where I can get strawed? And the driver said, I've been asked that question a hundred times, but never before in the Foo Perfect Subjunctive. <laughs> I did a show for three years with Johnny Carson called Who Do You Trust? Bad grammar, but a good show. Who Do You Trust? And finally I had to leave it to MC uh, my own shows for love or money and keep it in the family. One on CBS, the other on ABC. And Art Stark, the producer, said, Bill, this is the little theater right next to uh, Sardi's restaurant, 44th Street. He said, Bill, there's a fellow upstairs that says he knows you and he wants you to your job. He told me his name. I said, yeah, we used to use him in Philadelphia when I was there for the Wednesday night place. He fits the bar. Couldn't say a word. I said, I think I'll do a good job for you. So uh, I left the show, and he, he, he came on and did it with Johnny. His name was George. Uh, Here's Johnny. What, what's his name, George? Ed McMahon. Ed McMahon. Oh, boy. Oh, Ed, Ed McMahon. And to this day, Ed thanks me every Christmas. <laughs> uh, then Woody Woodbury took the, the show when, when, Arnie, when Johnny went to, uh, uh, to the Tonight Show. <clears throat> Woody told one view story. This lady is bending over a grave in a cemetery, <laughs> sobbing her heart out, saying, Why did you leave us? Why did you have to leave us? Another woman came by and said, Your husband, of course, you know his first wife. <laughs> <laughs> but my favorite story was told to me by Milton Berle, who was a great guy. He loved jazz and swing. He loved classical music. I used to go to the uh, uh, Carnegie Hall with him and met all of Nopla. He said these gentlemen were hanging around the bar, the members of a committee, and the meeting is over with, and they're having a few drinks. And the chairman stood up and said, let's face it, all lawyers are bastards. And this guy said, I resent that. Well, you would. You're a lawyer. He said, no, I'm a bastard. <laughs> That's what I would be if I kept up here any longer. So I want to thank you very much. God bless you all. And happy birthday to you whenever it happens. Thank you.